Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And it's been absolutely ages since I filmed a late night plant video and I actually wasn't planning on filming this. I was just gonna sit down and do some planty things, but it's always more fun when I do it with you guys. So if you've got planty things to do as well, then feel free to do them along with me. But yes, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. So the first thing that I've been meaning to do for absolutely ages is get my Philodendron Parezo Verde onto a decent moss pole because as you can see she's got some crazy aerial roots and I just haven't given her anything to climb at all. I've been saying for months and months and months that I need to do it and for whatever reason I've just been putting it off. And also looking at her roots at the bottom, as you can see, they're going pretty crazy. So I think I'll take a look at them, but I'm pretty sure she's going to be ready for a pot size up. Um, but the moss pole that I'm going to be making is going to be a little bit makeshift just because I've got a strip of wire that, as you can see, it's been cut with these spiky bits at the edges. So I'm going to have to bend them in. And I haven't actually seen my hole punch since I've moved house. So I've got some plastic and I'm going to make a D-shaped moss pole, but I have a feeling I'm probably going to have to poke holes with scissors or something to make the holes. So it may go very wrong, but that's what I'm going to be attempting first. And as usual, I asked you guys to send in some questions just because I haven't been very good at getting back to comments recently, as you may have noticed, and I've had quite a lot of questions about various things. So I put a thing on Instagram and I'm just going to go through and answer them as I go. And the first question is, how are you doing? Yes, on the whole, I'm I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. I'd say I'd say things in my life are fairly good at the moment. I've had a bit of like just a I don't know, a little bit of like a work-life balance issue recently, I think. And I spoke about this a little bit on Patreon recently. Um, I Again, I've spoken about this in so many videos before, but balance is just something that I do sometimes struggle with quite a lot in my life, especially being a freelancer and especially having to manage my own time, which most of the time touch all the wood, I would say I'm fairly good at. But I think the thing with that is that sometimes when when you kind of lose your flow a little bit, when something takes you out of your flow, it can be quite hard to pull yourself back up from it because there's nobody else kind of giving you a kick up the backside to do it. And I think just because my schedule's been thrown off a bit this month, there's been various things that have just kind of taken over and videos that I wanted to film and content that I wanted to make and things that I wanted to do work-wise have kind of just had to be reshuffled a bit it's just kind of made me go, oh my God, ah, uh, okay. And it's just all felt a little bit frantic at times. And for that reason as well, I think this is probably the first time in quite a while that I've had like proper plant burnout. And it's interesting, I was speaking to one of my friends about this recently. The plants in my bedroom are the plants that at the moment are kind of like suffering the most. On the whole, the ones with issues are the ones contained in my bedroom. And I could just say that's just because my bedroom doesn't get very good light. But I just know I haven't been taking as good a care of them as I could. And there's and my friend actually said something really interesting about this. She was saying that maybe do you think it's because your bedroom is like a rest area and in here, because I feel like I'm fairly on top of my plant care in this room. She was like, do you think maybe it's because this is a more like proactive space? And I genuinely think that is the case. And it's not that I want to take the plants out of my bedroom. I love having my plants in my bedroom, but I do just think that I need to make kind of like morning times, my plant care time in there when I'm feeling like energized and awake, because a lot of the time I do, I, I love doing evening plant stuff. It is probably my favorite thing to do. I mean, off camera as well, like a lot of the time I'll just pot around with my plants in the evening, do some watering, do some propagating, repotting, all that sort of stuff, because I just feel in a nice, relaxed headspace and for some reason I just don't I don't know I I do tend to neglect things through there a little bit so so yeah I'd say I'm slowly starting to get 
back on top of back on top of that i think obviously it's, it can be really difficult when you when you go through a phase of just i don't know not not having the burning desire to do plant care in the way that maybe you think you should and it's not that it doesn't bring me joy like i love it to bits but again i think sometimes when other life stuff is going on it can just fall to the back of your list and then when you start to see things going wrong, it can just, it can get all a bit overwhelming. You're like, oh my God, I don't even know where to start. So, so yeah, it's just kind of been a little bit of a, a mix of that recently. But aside from that, I would say, yeah, I would say life is good. How are you guys doing? Is everything good in your life? Do you have any exciting updates, any exciting plant updates, life updates, anything like that? Let me know in the comments because I genuinely love to read them and I love to know what you're doing but for me I think always always taking a bit of a social media break is a good thing and I to be honest most of the time I don't really think of YouTube as social media I kind of think like not that I really use Facebook but like Facebook Instagram TikTok all that sort of stuff I just know that a lot of the time I get so wrapped up in other people's worlds and it's just not very good for me and so when I'm kind of struggling a little bit with balance I often just naturally find myself taking a step back from those things like I haven't posted on Instagram in at least I'd say three four weeks and I, I kind of sometimes think to myself like come on Claire like plants are your life it's part of your job you need to just you need to just do it and sometimes I'm like I just don't want to do it so yeah I've I've just just giving myself a little break and um, continuing to tell myself that that is okay to do that because I think sometimes again especially since I've started doing like content stuff full time the pressure to be like well you need to be on it all the time because you are your own boss and people are expecting stuff from you can feel a little bit intense and I know that realistically that is just a pressure that I put on myself I know that if I took a few weeks off, you guys wouldn't be like, what, where's Claire gone? Like, bleh. like I know that's not a thing, but in my head it is. And I just need to, I just need to get over that. <laughs> I've actually had conversations with quite a few of you recently though about plant burnout and it is such a real thing. I think it's also, I mean, it's definitely something that's important to be spoken about because it's so easy to think again from things like social media that everybody is just on it all the time and everyone's collections are beautiful and everything's doing great and oh, I've just got this one yellow leaf and it it doesn't work like that. And I mean, I, I do planty things all the time and I've always got things going wrong and there are, I mean, I was going to say days, sometimes there are weeks and weeks and weeks where I just don't feel like doing anything and I really have to say to myself, okay, what is the bare minimum that you can be doing at this point just to make sure that your plants stay alive, even if it's not bringing you as much joy as you think it should be at the moment, just kind of do the tick box things and that that love for it will come back and it, I mean it is starting to come back this is why I, I was looking forward to doing this this evening I kind of was just looking in my cabinet and I was like okay there's things in here that I've been meaning to tackle for a while let's just get them out and let's just sit down and and do do some stuff and for me that is usually the way to combat it if I'm feeling like I want to get out of that space and I want to get back into loving planty life the answer is usually just to kind of do it and as soon as I start and I start kind of spending time with my plants again and noticing things about them, then on the whole, not always, but usually I'll I'll start to kind of catch the bug again. But it's, it's impossible to just be on it all the time, isn't it? I don't think, I'd be very surprised if there's anyone that just never has a day where they're like, you know what, I don't fancy doing that. But I think the lovely thing is as well, especially when you're kind of ticking things off the list, like for example, the Pareto Verde that I've been meaning to do for ages, I know that once this is done, I'm gonna feel really good about myself because I've been looking at this plant for months and months and months and I've said it in multiple videos like, oh, I'm gonna get this one on a moss pole soon. And it's just been one of those things that I'm like, oh, but it's kind of effort. And although I know that the plant needs it and although I know that I will feel really good once I've done it, it's just kind of mustering up the energy to do it in the first place and I haven't I haven't got there yet so yeah this is this is gonna make me feel really happy when it's done let me just measure to see I mean I may as well do the whole length it's 
a fair bit bigger but I know that this plant does grow quite quickly so yeah I'm gonna do all of it. The next question is which plant do you find the most challenging? Um, so I've got a video that I've actually already filmed but I haven't edited yet on the plants that I find the most difficult in my collection. Um, it does vary and there are some that I might think are doing really good things and then all of a sudden will just take a turn and surprise me but I would say number one on my list if I had to say the most challenging plant that I have owned is probably my variegated alocasia fry deck. It's just I mean, there's a few, but that's one that I, I just, I'll speak, I speak about it more in that video, but I just don't get that plant. Like, I feel like it's, it's constantly surviving. It hasn't died, but it's just given me so much grief and I've done so much research into it. I feel like I've kind of done all the right things for it and it's just doing really weird things. So yeah, I would say if I had to, just one that is the most challenging plant in my collection right now. What about you guys? Do you have a plant that you really struggle with? It's funny, isn't it? I was going to say some people will, it's obviously like, it depends on your home environment and all that sort of stuff. But it also just, I think, kind of comes down to the person as well, because there's some plants that are notoriously hard to look after and some people find really easy and some that are supposedly really easy and people find really difficult and I always just find that quite fascinating because for example I've chatted to my friend Emma about this many times she cannot keep spider plants alive and she really struggles with them and for me they are probably my easiest plants but and she's an amazing plant parent like she's got insane plants in her collection but I just always find that really interesting. So yeah, let me know, let me know in the comments what yours are. One of you asked, is there any way to make propagation happen faster? Uh, so, I mean, it obviously depends on the type of plant you're propagating. With the majority of tropical plants, and I have spoken about this before, the majority of tropical plants respond really, really well to light, heat and humidity. Like, for, I mean, it's basically just replicating replicating their natural growing conditions and doing everything as it would be naturally done in nature. Hence why a lot of people say that you shouldn't propagate over the winter months just because colder, darker conditions often mean that your propagation will not be successful or it's not going to happen as quickly. Um, I have now my, my little propagation cabinet that I had when I was living at my old place. I've got that in my bedroom now and I use that as a, did I just say propagation cabinet? my little cabinet that I had before, I use it now as a purely propagation cabinet just because I've got grow lights in there which obviously replicate natural daylight, it's getting fantastic light, it's got really good heat, it's got really good humidity and I just find that propagation, I mean it, it happens like that when I put plants in there so if you're able to do that on the whole I would say that's a great way to speed up the propagation process but yeah if it's about a specific plant then comment it down below and I'll try and help because as I say it does obviously depend on the type of plant but again if you don't have a cabinet you can do the plastic bag method which I tend to do for acclimating plants which is basically just where you take your propagation container if you're using moss, water, lacquer, perlite, whatever you're using and you just put a plastic bag over over the top of it, blow the plastic bag up, put some sellotape around it to just seal that humidity in and that essentially creates, it's kind of like a little terrarium but that just creates a really lovely humid environment for your plants to be able to propagate in because humidity really does tend to help with tropical plant propagation so yeah that would probably be my best advice on that. Okay and now I'm just going to measure the plastic. I probably want my bulge to be about that. I want to make sure I've got enough room to put my little plastic cup on top so that my, I'll, I'll show you properly, this light's not great but I'll show you properly when I've done it, um, enough room to put my plastic cup on so I can let the moss pole hydrate. So yeah, I'm not super strict with my measuring. I know some people are, but I'm just going to kind of wing it and hope that this goes okay. I mean, that fold is not completely straight. 
but I'm not going to be too much of a perfectionist about this. I think that will work. I just folded it so that I've got a line to cut along. Um, in fact, I'll do the other piece as well because I am going to have to use a couple of pieces to fit the length of this pole. Again, not completely straight, but I think it will work. The next question is one that I have actually had before and I don't think I've ever got around to answering, but it is, who is your favourite non-planty YouTuber? Oh, that's a really difficult one because I do actually watch, I probably watch more YouTube than I watch TV and I've got a lot of creators that I absolutely love who are non-planty. I, I think if I had to say... I would probably say there's a guy called Jamie Rains who uh, is Jammy Dodger on YouTube. I will put his channel there. Um, but he's a transgender man and he makes loads of, I mean, he's just hilarious. He makes loads of amazing LGBTQ plus content. Um, he makes a complete mix of educational stuff and just very hilarious, brilliant videos. And I just love his energy. I find him brilliant to watch his lovely wife Sharba as well she is brilliant and when they do collaboration videos I just love it I could watch them all day so yeah I would say if I had to pick just one then Jamie would probably be my favourite I would say yeah okay final answer okay so these are going to be a little bit uneven I can see I can see that already but that's okay that's all right. I don't think you'll notice when it's actually done. The main thing that I'm concerned about is the fact that, as I've already said, I don't have a hole punch. Um, and I'm going to have to try and create these holes with scissors. Uh, and usually, actually, I was going to say, usually I wouldn't mark up the plastic. I would just punch and go for it. But because I'm doing this in a slightly weird way, I am going to grab a Sharpie. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to hold the plastic on the wire and I'm just going to mark where I want to so punch my holes, poke my holes, uh, and then I can just line it up roughly with the other side. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do and I think it'll be fine. One of you asked how my pink princess philodendron was and you said it made me sad the last time I saw her. Yeah, it's making me pretty sad as well, to be honest. She's she's not doing great. She's been, I would say, probably the main struggle I've had since moving house. On the whole, I'm, I'm fairly happy with how most of my plants have done since I've moved, but she's she's just not coped with the change well at all and i've lost pretty much all of the lovely pink variegation on her she is giving me new growth but it's it's just not as healthy as it was before and to be completely honest i know i've kind of toyed with the idea of chopping her up at some point i'm seriously seriously thinking it now and i'm actually so there's a plant swap another plant swap are doing another plant swap um in I want to say April, I'll put the date on the screen and there are going to be tickets if you guys want to come. All the details will be on their Instagram, so make sure to follow them. Um, but I'm really tempted to chop her up and take her to the plant swap just because although she's a plant that has brought me so much joy in the time that I've owned her, I, I'm just like, if she's not suited to my environment now, I know I could move her through here and there's certain things I could do. I just don't think I've got the motivation to do it anymore with that plant. Like, it's it's a difficult one. The Pink Princess is a plant that I think for me was a little bit overhyped. And I actually, funnily enough, before the first plant swap, I considered chopping her up then. And then she started giving me this amazing, huge growth. And I was like, oh my God, she's doing such brilliant things that I can't chop her up. And I think that's kind of been the thing that's kept me from doing it sooner. And although, yes, it's very impressive and I'm glad that the plant has been healthy. I I, I just don't, I kind of feel like I'm I'm ready for her to find a new home. So, so yeah, I will either, I think, consider letting her go as a big full plant, but obviously someone would have to come and pick her up 
or I might just take some cuttings to the plant swap. I'm undecided at the moment, but if I do decide to maybe like, I don't know, pass her on to a new home, keep an eye on my Instagram stories, I might list her at some point. And if any of you are interested, then um, then I'd love her to go to one of you. So, so yeah, but I'm just, I'm a bit on the fence at the moment. It, like if she makes a massive turnaround and she starts doing really well, then uh, I don't know, then I was gonna say, then maybe I'll keep her, but actually I kind of think that I kind of think that maybe she's just not the plant for me anymore. It does just happen sometimes and it's so hard. Whoa. Also, I'm going to have to try not to stab myself as I do this. It's so hard not to feel bad about falling out of love with a plant, especially, and it's going to sound really silly, but especially with a plant like her that I've like hyped up on my YouTube channel so many times and I've been like, oh my God, she's doing so amazingly. It's so hard to not feel really bad for being like actually maybe I will chop that plant up and get rid of her because I kind of feel like I ought to be like I ought to still feel the same way about her and it's rare that I fall out of love with the plant but it, yeah I uh, yeah I'll, I'll keep you updated with my my thought process with that plant because at the moment as I say I'm just very undecided um but yeah, that was a very long-winded answer, but she's she's doing okay. She's not doing great. She could be doing better, and I don't think at the moment I am offering her the best care is the long and the short of it. Although it's a bit of a faff doing it this way, it's probably not going to look quite as neat. These holes actually aren't coming out terribly. Like I'll definitely be able to get a cable tie through there, which is good because I had a fear that this was just going to split the plastic and I wouldn't be able to do anything. Would you say begonia is a good plant for beginners? Oh, you're uh, sorry. I'm being very vague with these answers, but you're probably asking the wrong person because I'm not actually that experienced with begonias. I have actually got one here that is on my list of things to do. I'm going to pop this up at some point if I have time in this video. Um, Yes, in my in my experience, they haven't been ridiculously difficult to look after, all of the ones that I've had anyway, but I haven't had that many just because, I don't know, I, I like, if you've watched my channel for a while, you'll know that I used to be not anti-begonia, but I just, I really, I just wasn't a fan of them and I didn't really want any in my collection. I had a very long period where I didn't have any in my collection at all and all of the ones more or less all of the ones that I've got now have been gifted to me or I've gotten swaps and I really like them like I do like them but I don't think I would be in a rush out a, a rush to go out and get any more begonias for myself so um so yeah with the experience that I've got of the plants I do think they're fairly easy they seem to be very low maintenance um I have actually got one my elbow picta that is not doing well for me at the moment but Again, I think that's down to me. I do chronically underwater that plant um, and it was really happy in the conditions that I had it in before I moved. So yeah, I, I would say maybe it's not the easiest plant. Like if you could go for, I don't know, a cast iron plant or a snake plant or a ZZ plant or something like that. I know maybe they're not as interesting. Um, I would say I would say begonias are a fairly good beginner plant what do, what do you guys think like I'm sure a lot of you are way more experienced with begonias than I am um it's definitely definitely not been a genus that's been the most difficult I don't think it would be one that I mean it wouldn't be one that I would recommend to beginners if I was asked but purely because I I don't have enough knowledge in that area but yeah that would be my thoughts on it but do let me know what you think. Someone asked, what star sign are you? Uh, so I think, I think, I think, I think, I, I, so I'm on the cusp. I, my birthday's on September the 23rd and I grew up thinking that I was a Libra, but then some, some sources say that I'm a Virgo and I've got some friends that are super into star signs. I, I mean, to be honest, I don't know enough about it, but some people are like, oh my goodness, you're such a Virgo, or oh my God, you're such a Libra. And I'm just like, okay. Um, but I haven't got a straightforward answer as to what I actually am. So 
Um, I'm either a Libra or a Virgo, but I cannot confirm for sure which of those I am. So yeah, again, if you know, let me know. But um, but yeah, I'm 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 very I'm very interested in learning more about star signs. I know it's something that I've got a lot of friends actually that are very very much into that sort of thing and. I think some of the accuracy around what can kind of be anticipated or predicted from certain things within your star signs is absolutely fascinating, but it's just something that I've never really kind of taken a deep dive into. So yeah, I would be interested to know more. And I just realized that I skipped a question. Someone said, I want to start a YouTube channel. How did you start? Um, so I, mine happened, I guess, kind of by accident. Like I was, I was running, um, a little online plant shop at the time that I started during lockdown. Um, and I have kind of like briefly touched on this before, but I started my YouTube channel. My partner at the time said that I should start and, um, I was like, okay, I'll give it a go. I was really, really scared, but I was just very focused on finding different ways to promote my shop. Um, and actually it, it turned out that I started doing YouTube and I was like, oh my God, I absolutely love this. And when I had to move during lockdown, I wasn't able to do my shop anymore. That's when I was just, I just fell in love with content creating. And I was like, this is fantastic. I can't believe I wasn't doing this sooner. So in terms of what was the question? Um, how did you start? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's how I started. I started making very kind of straightforward, uh, very non-personal educational videos about planty things and um, and from there just over time have kind of started to chat a little bit more and do things like this and get to know the community a little bit better and I mean that's kind of like an in a nutshell, um, in a nutshell my journey on YouTube. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of things that if I was to go back and start again, I think I'd do very differently. There's also a lot of things that I've learnt doing this because it's it's just an area that I knew absolutely nothing about. Like I would never, I don't think if it hadn't been for lockdown and all the time that we had and the fact that I was furloughed and the fact that my ex said to me, you should just give this a go. I, I definitely don't think I would have tried it otherwise. I don't think I would have had the nerve to try it because it seems so scary and I look back at like my first video and I look absolutely petrified. I remember sitting on my bedroom floor just psyching myself up to try and film this video. Also sorry this is really loud I'm not using my microphone for this video and I have a feeling this might be a little bit late. Um, but yeah I remember sitting down to try and film that first video and I think the video probably came out in about 12 minutes and it honestly took me about an hour to film because I would read the question and I would answer the question and I'd be like, no, that's not accurate. And then I would go back and I'd try and do it again. And I was just really, really in my own head with it all. And I think that's totally normal. Like, I think you're supposed to be in your own head with this sort of stuff because it's not like it's a natural, it doesn't feel natural when you first start doing it. It's kind of like, learning to drive a car or something like that the first time you get in the driver's seat even if you've got an idea of what driving should feel like you it all just feels very foreign and very strange so um so yeah it took me a long time to get used to that but then also oh hang on I haven't lined my lines up what am I doing what am I doing line 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 but yeah, also when I started, to, uh, I think when I started to not take it so seriously and I started making more chatty videos like this and stuff like that and actually taking time to, as I say, get to know you guys a lot more and like get to know the community and not feel like I just had to be a source of information. That's when I started to really kind of relish it and think, okay, well, this is... It's, it's like, it's such an incredible creative outlet. And and yeah, I I really honestly, I like it's it's my favorite thing to do. I, I love being a YouTuber. I don't like saying that I'm a YouTuber because I think it sounds a little bit silly, um, but I really honestly love it. I won't like delve too much into the, like the, what I would have done because I think 
probably a lot of us aren't here for that but if I mean it'd be very different but if you want a video on like things that I would have done differently things that I thought worked well then um then let me know and I would happily make that video like I I have genuinely found and I still do to this day find like learning about YouTube stuff really fascinating and I mean essentially like having your own little at home TV channel that you can just do in your own time you can do in your pajamas and it's yeah it's just wonderful I really enjoy it so um I would encourage you to start your channel and even if you are feeling nervous and like it feels all a little bit out of your out of your depth at the moment every single person that started on YouTube will also have felt that way and just I mean the, okay one piece of advice I would give is don't take it too seriously I think I took it way too seriously at first and I actually started noticing progression in my channel and pro like kind of self progression in myself when I stopped when I kind of took the pressure off a bit and I wasn't just like right okay we're going to film this video and it's going to be a good one it was just more fun and relaxed and that is a piece of advice that I would definitely give myself if I was going back and starting again but yeah good luck and drop your channel down below and I will make sure to subscribe just realized that I've cable tied this one in and I should have left that one out so I'm gonna cut that off and we will continue this way this way this way Somebody asked, why don't you like orchids? I really don't have a reason that I don't like, and to be honest, it's not that I don't like them, and I have said this in other videos before, it's not that I don't like orchids, it's just that I don't particularly, and I, when I say orchids, I don't mean jewel orchids, I love jewel orchids, I just don't particularly have the desire to have like standard orchids in my collection and I do know that there are loads of amazing types of orchids that you don't just see in your supermarkets I think they're beautiful like I've I've googled them I've I've seen lots of amazing orchids and I think they are beautiful like my friend Lottie was showing me pictures of there's like a naked man orchid and there's a monkey orchid the monkey orchid is amazing like if you haven't seen that you should definitely google it because it literally looks like a little monkey face and I think they're amazing, but I just have no desire to have one. And I don't really know why that is. I think it's just personal preference. Um, again, I've said it before, but I can go to other people's houses and they've got beautiful orchids and I can really appreciate them. But I mean, yeah, they're just, they're not a plant that particularly grabs me. I think I've got plants in my collection that other people probably wouldn't want in their homes. And there doesn't always have to be a reason for it. It's just it's just how it is. I think not having a hole punch in this scenario has definitely slowed me down. Like this is taking much longer than it would usually take. I'm also for some reason using way more cable ties than I would usually use. Usually I would do maybe that and I've done a lot but I've committed to doing that now so I feel like I need to stick to it and I'm therefore thinking maybe I won't get through as much as I wanted to in this video. I've literally got, oh, I'm not going to pick them all up, but I've got so many things here in front of me that were on my list. And I mean, I don't have to get through everything tonight. I will just keep going until I feel tired. But yeah, often things do just take a lot longer than you think they're going to. Another question was, do you have brothers and sisters? Uh, I don't think I've answered this one before. No, I don't. I I have got a, I'm an only child and I have a very, very, very small family. Um, I always wanted to, like growing up, I always wanted to have brothers and sisters. I used to have lots of imaginary brothers and sisters. Uh, and I would, I, like, I mean, to be honest, to a certain extent, I still am. Like if I go to a friend's house that comes from a really big family and they've got like, mum, dad, brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, they've got all that sort of stuff, then I I really enjoy being in that atmosphere and I always kind of wish that in some ways that that was my family, but, but it can also feel a little bit overwhelming. I don't know if anyone else, again, comes from a small family or is an only child, but it can just feel a bit much because I, most of the time, was so used to it just being me and my mum that, like, those kind of situations just make me go oh my god this is really scary and overwhelming but at the same time it's lovely like it's really nice so 
yeah, now that I'm older, I really don't mind being an only child at all, actually. In some ways, I'm quite... In a size, I'm grateful, is that the right word? I was going to say in some ways I'm quite grateful for it. I, I think I'm grateful for some of the things that it's given me. Like, I, I really enjoy my own space. I really enjoy peace and quiet. I don't know if this is an only child thing, but I think I've just grown up being very used to those things and um, the things now that I really appreciate. When I think of like, when I think of lovely big family, the image that always pops into my mind is the Weasleys from Harry Potter. I always think of the Weasley family and I'm like, oh, all of them just like squished together in a room. That, that must be so lovely. And their Christmases must be so nice and it just yeah it must just be so like I don't know warm and cozy and lots of people kind of bustling about and there's a part of me that really loves the idea of that but as I say I mean there's not a lot I can do I can't change it but um yeah now that I'm older it, it doesn't it doesn't like bother me but growing up I did wish that I had brothers and sisters <laughs> I always had lots of animals and as sad as it may be, I used to call them my brothers and sisters. So I had my um, me and my mum's dog Biscuit. He was my he was my brother. Um, so I yeah I didn't have any human ones, but I definitely had some four legged ones. Okay, and I have actually got a massive new bag of soil ninja sphagnum moss, but for moss poles. I've got some of this left over. This is just the cheap being hue stuff. And it's not bad. Like, I have used it multiple times. But for moss poles, I think I'm just going to go in with this because I'd like to use it up. And because the Soil Ninja stuff is such lovely live sphagnum moss, I think I'm probably going to save that for propagation. And I personally like to stuff my moss poles as I go and just kind of seal it as I go. But I know some people do the whole thing and then stuff the whole thing. Again, it's just down to personal preference. If you had to get rid of five plants right now, what and why? Oh God, these questions, you guys know how indecisive I am. Um, mm, if I had to get rid of five plants. Okay, I've got, whoa. I suddenly got louder um i would probably do propagations count or do you mean full plants i'm gonna okay i'm gonna discount propagations and i'm gonna say full plants um i would get rid of my my standard green spider plants just because i've got so many babies of the mother plant and the mother plant has been a little bit temperamental recently i love her but she's one that just kind of falls under my radar a bit I think I could part with her uh oh this might actually count as three it's only one plant but I've potted it up as three but my philodendron sodoroy af I'm still thinking I might take some bits of that to the plant swap to swap just because I really like it but crawling plants it just I mean it's just so difficult to find room for them and I did have quite a lot of struggles with that plant and while I would like to get it back to health and try again i think if i'm being brutal i would probably get rid of that that's two i could probably bring myself to part ways with one of my philodendron silver swords just because i've got three of them um although i do love that plant and i really do quite like having duplicates of it because i like seeing it everywhere um okay right quick fire i'm gonna go ace canathus marmoratus my black pagoda lipstick plants love it but I if I had to would pop that one my philodendron brantianum again I really like that plant but oh in fact hang on let me replace that with something else um my skindapsis trubii moonlight that's one that I I said I wouldn't buy again it's one that just hasn't done a lot for me even since I've removed the pot around its roots I'm not I'm not loving it uh how many was that one two three was that four I think that was four but I've lost count um and then i would say my begonia albo pick to the one that i said wasn't doing very well because again although i love that begonia i, I do love that begonia I'm, I'm just not that massively attached to it compared to some of my others so i think i could quite easily part with that one i think i think i don't know if that was five i'm gonna just say that that was five 
What's the best book and movie of yours? Um, oh, favourite book and favourite movie. Uh, I, I know my favourite book. My favourite book is hands down The Secret History by Donna Tartt. It is the best book I've ever read. I actually want to reread it because I haven't read it for years and I thought it was absolutely amazing. It's, how would you describe it? I guess it's kind of like a psychological thriller. It's kind of like a crime drama, but it's not, it's not scary <laughs> because I do get freaked out quite easily. Uh, I just found it a really interesting read and the whole concept is just fascinating. It's one of her, so I think, I think I'm right in saying she's only written three books and her most famous one's one called The Goldfinch, um, which I also read and I thought was good, but oh my God, The Secret History just blew my mind. Uh, I remember reading that when I was at drama school and every single time we got a lunch break, I would literally just go go to the common room with my book and I would just read that because I got so into it um, and I couldn't put it down. And I think when you find a book like that, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm not, um, like nowadays, I don't make enough time to read. Like I used to love it when I was younger, but I don't do it a lot nowadays. But that one is, that one's definitely up there. Um, and movies, that's a really, oh, whoa, almost knocked over the plants. Um, that's a really difficult one. I've got so many, so many movies that I would say are my favourite. Um, one that I, I guess this is more of a recent movie, but I would say it's gone to fairly high on my list, is Boiling Point. It's, um, it's got Stephen Graham in it, who is one of my... Oh, you know what I've just done? I've just um, forgotten to seal that bit in, so I need to cut this one as well. I'm not focused tonight. Um, but yes, yeah, Stephen Graham is one of my favourite actors. I think he is absolutely outstanding in pretty much everything I've ever seen him in. Um, and if you're interested in like film and the making of film and just the art of film, then I would highly recommend it. It's no spoilers, but it's basically um it follows a night in a restaurant and it's all done in one shot like they the camera never cuts it's pretty much done like uh like a theater piece like they would rehearse it in the same way as they rehearse theater and obviously it's a lot more complex because it's a whole camera crew and it's just an absolute masterpiece and i think because the camera never cuts you're just like you have you were just in on the action you have no time to like step away it's it is just phenomenal and I think it came out last year and I've seen it about four times already and I was telling friends about it the other day and I would very much like to watch it again so I wouldn't say it's my all-time favourite movie but it's one that what like a new one that really kind of got me going for the first time in a while um oh we could talk about films all day like if, if, I was gonna say, if, you want, if you want a video specifically talking about films I'd happily do that yeah that's a really tricky one um I also love oh, okay just a few more films I love the film Pride I think it is outstanding I think it is brilliant uh I'm gonna pronounce this very badly because my French accent is very questionable but the film Le Vion Rose Le Vion Rose with Marion Cotillard uh, I think that is a stunning film. Again, I've seen it so many times. I absolutely love it. And then I've just got a whole list of very cheesy ones as well and funny, silly films like Bridesmaids and stuff like that. I mean, it's so silly, but so brilliant and so funny. Um, I know you only asked for one, but you've got a few there. Uh, yeah, I could, I could talk about that for a lot longer, but... Um, yeah, we're going to go with favourites right now. Secret history, book choice and, and boiling point at the moment. Some of these are going very non-planty. The next one is favourite breed of dog. Uh, I, I really love a mixed breed dog. I really do. Um, Yoli is a complete and utter mix and I think she is the most wonderful dog. Um... I mean, like, I obviously think, like, cockapoos are very cute. I think French bulldogs are very cute. I'm just kind of more drawn to the big, beefy, weird dogs. 
um that's just my preference i always think one day okay pure breed dog that i really love is an alsatian i think i mean there's loads of pure breeds actually that i love i love labradors i love rottweilers oh my god i love all the dogs uh but alsatians i love and i've always had it at the back of my mind because obviously yoli has come with a lot of a lot of baggage and requires constant training and is always just on her on her journey and launching herself at everything she sees um i always think at some point further down the line i might look into getting a they're obviously way 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 in the future when yoli is way in the future um, I might look into potentially adopting a ex-police dog. I mean, like, they can be Spaniels, they can be Alsatians, but I like obviously they'd come incredibly well trained, um, and they would have served out their life doing doing all their work, and they'd just be ready for some downtime. So, at the back of my mind, I've always thought maybe that's something I would do in the future. But I don't want to be dog prejudiced. There's, I don't think there is a single breed of dog that I don't like. There's some that I probably wouldn't go for as a dog for myself. Um, and I'd like to think as well, I mean, this might not always be the case and obviously sometimes things just happen, but I'd like to think that I'd always rescue. I do love, I, I've, I've had rescue dogs all my life. And although Yoli is a challenge, like she might not seem it in videos because she's just, very sweet and just kind of pops up here and there she she's a challenging girl at times um i do love having rescue dogs and it's very rewarding when when you see them making progress so uh so yeah but i wouldn't say i have a favorite breed how can i make my calathea not hate me um again like calatheas are that I, I spoke earlier about plants that some people find really easy and some people find really difficult. Calatheas, although some people can just naturally be very good with them, calatheas are one that I know a lot of people struggle with just because they require such high levels of humidity. They are probably more high maintenance than a lot of, uh, I mean, definitely a lot of plants in my collection. Like they like their soil to be consistently moist. Um, oops, put moss all over my face. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of your Calathea not hating you, I think just look at the environment you've got it in at the moment and kind of go through a process of elimination as to what might be going on. It depends why your Calathea is hating you, like what the symptoms are. Um, if you feel like you're getting everything right environmentally, then it's always a good idea to check the roots and make sure that the substrate you're using is right. As I've literally just said, humidity as well for Calatheas, I think kind of like a, a bare minimum of 60% most of the time on average is, is going to be what they need. If, you, if it drops much lower, then you're going to notice browning and curling leaves and crisping and all that sort of stuff. And actually, I have got that going on with my Calathea Zebrina. Is it Zebrina? Is it a Zebrina or am I just confusing that with my Alocasia Zebrina? The one with the stripy leaves. If I've got that wrong, I'll put the name on the screen. Um, but yeah, that one's giving me some drama at the moment. And I do think that that's probably down to the fact that I have just struggled with humidity a bit since I've moved here. Like this is this is a very dry space compared to where I was before. And while a lot of my plants have adapted really well to the environmental changes, a lot of my calatheas, or I mean that one specifically, have just kind of gone, oh my goodness, shock. And there's definitely some things that I need to reevaluate with my care of that plant, I think. I probably need to move it closer to a humidifier. It's probably ready for a soil upgrade. I haven't repotted it in a while and I should probably have a look at its roots. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if there's if there's nothing, if there's nothing like immediately obvious and you're still having issues and you have got the humidity high, you are getting the right balance of watering, as I say, have a look into, into the soil, have a look at the roots and make sure you're fertilizing if it's if it's actively growing make sure you're giving it all the nutrients it needs i have also made uh breakdown videos on calathea care on my channel before um i made a i mean actually i was gonna say i made one when i first started on youtube although i think a lot of information in that is still accurate um i would personally go and refer to one like my calathea orbifolia video which i made i think about four or five months ago or something like that because it tends to be fairly similar for most types of calatheas.
Okay, so this poll has taken a shockingly long time to make. Uh, as I say, I'm pretty certain that it's partly down to the fact that I had to kind of bend all the wire and the fact that I didn't have any, um, what do you call them? Hole punches, that's the one. Uh, but I think it's it's come out okay. I think I could maybe stuff a little bit more moss in there. Um, yeah, I think I could probably get a little bit more in, so I might just shove a bit more in before I get the plants out of its pot. Uh, you want, obviously, you want to be able to encourage the aerial roots into the moss pole, but also you want to make sure it retains moisture really well. And if the moss isn't compact enough, then it's just going to dry out really, really quickly. And I don't want that, so I'm just going to try and get a bit more in there. Okay, right, so now I should have given this plant a water before I started doing this, but oh, it might just make it a little bit trickier, but I'm just going to put the old soil straight into this bag so that I can throw it away. I have had questions before about whether or not I reuse soil, and on the whole I don't, just because if a plant's been potted in it for a while, it's not so much, I mean it's partly cross-contamination, but also, if it's been in the soil for a while, it's likely going to have used up a lot of the nutrients in that soil and it's no benefit to your other plants by reusing it. So I tend to just compost it and not reuse it on, on my other plants. Oh wow, the roots have also started to grow out the bottom of this pot. So yeah, it's definitely time for an upgrade. Oh dear, yeah, this is so dry. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, I might just try and give it a little wiggle and hope I can loosen it off a bit. Also, unless a plant is majorly, majorly root bound, I don't always worry nowadays about getting all the soil off. I'll just kind of break up as much as I can. Um, and then, yeah, so long as there's some space for the roots to expand and they're not just tangled in a knot, like, I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. I might just break them up a little bit more, but then I'll just go ahead and pot around that again. I just actually need to find a slightly bigger pot. I didn't bring a massive selection over. This might be teetering on the big side, but I'm thinking, I think this is probably like a 14 centimetre pot or something like that. But I think once the moss pole's in there, Perfect as well. So I've just left a gap at the bottom so I can fill that with soil. I think that should. Yeah, I think that should be pretty perfect for that plant. So I'm just going to mix up some soil. It's always so hard to judge the amount. I always end up doing either way too much or not enough. So I'm going to teeter on too much and then I can always use it for the next pot up because as I say I brought so much stuff over to do stuff with and this has taken much longer than I anticipated so I feel like we might just be working with this plant in this video just adding some worm castings in there as well for extra fertilization natural fertilization and some activated charcoal because why not give this plant the full shebang and then hopefully, hopefully it will kick into action and start doing some amazing things for me. I know a lot of you also ask about like ratios for soil mixes as well. I used to be so ridiculous to the point that I would like measure ratios for soil mixes and nowadays I just kind of free pour. I think so long as you've got a nice balance of what the plant needs like for example this one it needs something fairly chunky fairly aerated i've got perlite i've got bark i've got all that sort of stuff and then i just add in what my gut says in terms of things like worm castings and charcoal and it seems to work fairly well so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna overthink it too much and this is quite a heavy moss pole I might see if I could fill the bottom of the pole with lecker because that might just help to keep some of the weight at the bottom and stop it from toppling. I'm going to give that a go. I don't know if that's going to work. 
people to just have to be aware when it gets to this time of night, my downstairs neighbor's bedroom is right below this room and I'm just kind of crashing about and doing planty things. I need to be a little bit quiet. I think there is a high chance that all the lecker is just gonna fall straight through the gaps in the wire, but let's, let's see. Also, I was just thinking, um, so I've never actually done this adding lacquer to the bottom of a pole. I think the one thing we're gonna have to be a little bit careful about is that because obviously lacquer is clay and it absorbs lots of moisture is that it doesn't absorb all of the moisture from the moss pole. I might have to just work on keeping this one extra hydrated. Do any of you ever use lacquer at the bottom of your poles? This is just kind of a little experiment. And you live and you learn, don't you? So who knows, maybe it will do great things and maybe it won't. Okay, so now is the fun bit. We're gonna have to do this fairly quickly because it's all gonna spill out otherwise. Whoa! Did that work? Did that work? Oh, it's all spilling out. Oof, could have gone worse, but could have gone better. Um, let's just hope that this will stay the way we want it and lean it up there for now. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just going to encourage these aerial roots here into the moss pole. Uh, and then I might tie it in place as well, just to make sure it is extra secure. Someone said, is £200 too much to invest in a plant? I think it really depends. I mean, it, it really depends. I think it it depends on firstly how much you want the plant, um, how much you've shopped about, how much you would value that plant at. Because I mean, I think the important thing to remember is sometimes, especially with certain genuses like philodendron, for example, you might spend a huge amount on a plant and then in a few months time, you'll see it for a fraction of the price because it's been propagated and people are selling it a lot cheaper. Um, don't get me wrong, I have, in my time, I have invested large amounts of money in plants that I really, really want. Um, but there have been times as well that I've looked back on it and I've thought, oh my God, if I had literally just waited a little bit, like for example, my Monstera dubia that I love, I love that plant so much. Um, but I got that from Hutch House Plants in summer last year and I paid 90 pounds for it. And it was about that big when I first got it. Um, and literally a couple of weeks later, I saw them popping up for £30 and I was like, oh my goodness, if I'd literally just wasted a couple of weeks, I could have got it for a fraction of the price. Um, I don't regret getting the plant whatsoever, but I think so long as you do your research and so long as you can afford it and so long as you're not just buying the plant for the price tag and you know that it's genuinely going to make you happy, then, then yeah then absolutely go for it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a limit on it. It's like anything, but definitely don't get sucked into just buying it because, oh, it's an expensive plant. And I can say it's an expensive plant because firstly, it probably won't stay expensive forever. Uh, and secondly, it's a plant. Do what makes you happy and don't feel the need to be swayed by something that's like, oh, wow, look at how fancy and expensive I am. I'm skipping through a few questions now because there's one that I can see on here that has been asked a lot recently after I made my biological pest control video and it's how do you dust plants and not remove predatory mites? That is something that I absolutely should have covered in that video and as I say I know a lot of you've been asking about it. Um, so I know I always talk about using microfiber gloves to dust your plant's leaves. I personally won't use those when I'm also using predatory mites around a plant, just because obviously you can squish the mites very easily. And so what I've done, I've got like a, um, it's not a feather duster, but it's the same texture as a feather duster. And for the plants that I'm using predatory mites on, firstly, before I dust them, I'll just give them a really good look over. I'll see if I can see any mites on them because sometimes you won't have predatory mites on the plant at all. The ones that I use as a preventative measure are in little bags and there's a colony in that bag and they'll just release as and when. Um, 
if I can't see any mites, then I'll just go ahead and dust. If I can, then I'll obviously try and dust onto, onto the plant so that the mites will kind of be distributed and not harmed. But that is the way that I've done it so far. And obviously you don't want to go in and squish the mites. So I feel like that's a fairly effective way of doing it. And it seems to have worked well. If any of you have any better ways of doing it, then please do let me know. But that's just felt fairly instinctive for me. And yeah, I think I think it's done the job. So so yeah, that would be my approach to it. Oh, wow. Okay, that took ages, but we are finally done. She's on her moss pole and I think she's going to be very happy like that. I have just left a little gap at the top of the pole here and that's where I'm going to put the little cup with the hole in so that I can water the moss pole like that. I'll obviously give this plant a water once I finish filming, but yeah, I'm going to pop her. Oh, I hope she fits. Yeah, she will fit. I was going to say I'll pop her back in my cabinet. And fingers crossed the growth from now on will be a little bit more exciting. I'm really hoping for some of those gorgeous variegated leaves. Um, but I'll let you know how she gets on. Uh, and yeah, I really did think, I mean, probably overly ambitiously, I brought one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I brought ten things over to do, not including this. And I've got through one in this video, but... It is one that I've been meaning to do for a while, so I'm glad I have ticked it off my list. And if you guys were doing stuff along with this video, sorry, I've got moss in my throat. If you were doing stuff along with this video, I really hope you managed to get lots done as well. But I'm going to go get ready for bed because it's currently quarter to 11 and I am really quite tired. Um, but I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day and I a lovely evening and I will see you in the next video.